Yeah, my name's Grant. Um, I'll be talking about iNaturalist and Visipedia today. Um, the, this talk doesn't go too much into technical um, details. Um, it's kind of a more higher level application talk. Um, but please interrupt um, with questions if you have any. Um, OK, first, let me um, describe what Visipedia is. Uh, so <coughs> it's an academic project that investigates new machine learning techniques um, and systems for empowering uh, what we call communities of experts. Um, and so iNaturalist uh, is one of those communities. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, is another community. Um, and uh, the two PIs behind this project are Pietro Perona, uh, who's at Caltech right now, and Serge Belangi, who was at UC San Diego at the start of um, the Visipedia collaboration uh, and is now a professor uh, at Cornell. Um, OK, and so besides uh, academic outputs, um, Visipedia has, had, um, has uh, helped the, these partners um, have their own outputs. And um, sort of three of the, the more popular ones is this Merlin Bird ID app. Um, and this is something you can get on your, your phone right now. Um, so if, if I bore you in this talk, um, I would suggest downloading this and checking this out. Um, it helps you identify birds both through a, like a 20 question style interface as well as with um, a picture. But it's also like a really cool field guide. Um, so I think right now it covers uh, 4,000 or 5,000 species around the world. And it gives you really beautiful photos and maps and audio. Uh, and it's all available for free. Um, and then uh, we have iNaturalist, which I'll be talking about today. Um, and this uh, is similar to Merlin. They're trying to do everything. So Merlin is very focused on birds. Um, iNaturalist is much more broad. They'll cover, they're trying to help people identify things across the tree of life. Um, and then Seek um, is the newest member of these apps. Um, it was actually made by the iNaturalist teams um, and a few of us at Caltech. <coughs> and uh, I'll show a demo of it. It came out, um, let's see if this will play. Uh, so it came out earlier this year. Um, and what you're seeing is, is uh, real time identification on, this is an iPhone. Um, and it's taxonomic uh, classification. So what we were trying to do is make the experience of going outside and recognizing what's around you a bit more engaging. And so you're seeing these seven dots, and these correspond to the, the seven classic taxonomic ranks. So we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, and it just allows you to kind of like actually like in real time without having to talk to a community or you know have a network connection, you can just go point it at flowers or you know, if you're tide pooling or um, if you're just in your backyard, um, try to get you engaged um, and interested in all the wildlife around you. So that's available now. Um, and this is definitely kind of a work in progress of improving the vision systems. But um, a lot of the stuff I talked about today is actually building the data set that powers this app. So that's kind of the, that's the connection back to this thing. So I'll, I'll end with a brief comment about how we kind of made it quote unquote fast. It's actually a pretty simple trick that's been known for a while. Um, but that was doing like 25,000 way classification. Right? So it's um, a large scale classification that you can do on your phone. Um, OK, so let me dive into iNaturalist. Um, so iNaturalist is a platform that helps connect people with nature. right? And at its heart, it's a social network for naturalists. Right? So users can take photographs of wildlife uh, and upload them along with the geolocation as an observation to iNaturalist. And then the iNaturalist community um, comes in and helps the user identify the species in their photograph. <coughs> and ultimately, by aggregating many of these observations, uh, iNaturalist aims to help scientists understand the distribution and abundance of species over time. Um, so let me give a, a concrete example of an observation. Um, so this is a lizard that we found um, in the Caltech Computer Vision Lab. And uh, to create an observation, I snapped a photo of it and uploaded it to iNaturalist. Um, and so on iNat, uh, this observation gets initialized with the tag needs ID. Right? And so next, different members of the community notified about the observations through various means um, suggest identifications. Um, and so in this case, four people, including myself, um, put an identification on the observation. Um, and iNaturalist uses a majority vote to decide uh, the final label 
uh, for, for the image. And so in this example, everyone agreed. Um, so there's 100% consensus. Uh, but in general, INAT needs at least two-thirds consensus before um, it gets this research grade uh, species label. Um, okay, and so why is research grade important? Um, well, so those are the observations um, that INAT is going to bundle up and ship to GBIF, um, which is like a, an observation aggregator. Um, and it's through GBIF that scientists and conservationists are going to access the data and use it for like distribution and abundance modeling, right? And so if, um, if we want to answer questions, scientific questions, or make land use decisions, um, it's important that uh, the observations that we're putting into GBIF have high quality labels. Um, and so I think um, recently, uh, at the time, maybe like a few days ago, the, the size of this GBIF export is 10.1 million uh, observations, uh, where each observation has at least one photo. <coughs> okay, and so um, these observations are generated by uh, iNaturalists, come from users all over the world, um, and uh, the number of observations submitted is growing, right? And so um, there's currently over 25 million observations um, contributed by um, nearly 700,000 observers, spanning 230,000 species, um, and we're kind of reaching this 100K identifier. So these are all unique um, people that have put um, identifications on these 25 million observations. Um, and so we can actually visualize that data in a few different ways. And so what you're seeing here, um, kind of consider each column independently. Uh, each column will, will have 250 dots. Um, each dot um, represents, represents 100,000 observations. Um, and so each column represents the 25 million ops that are currently sitting in INAT. Um, filled dots represent data that was collected up to about December 2018. And unfilled dots is everything that we've gotten um, so far in 2019. Um, and so there's a few kind of interesting trends. So insects, we've already doubled the total number of insects um, in the iNaturalist database in 2019 alone. Um, Europe has already doubled. Um, Asia has already doubled. Um, South America has already doubled. Um, and so INAT is experiencing this really nice growth. Um, but of course, there's challenges that come with growth. Um, and a big one is how do you maintain data quality and how do you efficiently use kind of the expertise of the community when you're rapidly growing? Um, and so let me just highlight some of the potential problems or some of the highlighted problems um, in iNaturalist's current majority vote methodology. Um, and so we'll, we'll stick with a kind of a cartoon example. So here we have a, an observation uh, where the ground truth label is Asian ladybird. And um, we'll see a few different scenarios and the user identifications will show up down here and the consensus identification, sort of the, the majority vote computation uh, will show up up here. <coughs> okay, and so this first example highlights what we call the unskilled identifier problem. Right? And so this is where we have two unskilled users um, that have provided the same incorrect identification of seven spotted ladybird. Um, and so we can see after two of them, we get this greater than two-thirds consensus. And so this observation gets a research grade label um, with, the, with an incorrect label. Um, and so this is, and this is going to get packaged up into our GBIF export. Um, and so this is a, this is a corruption uh, of that data set. Um, this example highlights um, sort of an inefficiency that occurs when you're using this um, uh, majority vote and you need to override early misidentifications, right? So it was only this first user that did, uh, that provided a miss ID. Um, everybody else provided the correct um, true identification, but we needed three people to come in to, in order to override kind of this first one, right? And so this is a, an example of an inefficient use of the community um, where potentially we would rather have directed these guys to labeling uh, alternative observations. Um, and so finally, one more sort of problem is this uh, example of a lonely expert. Um, so we have one knowledgeable user that comes in and provides the correct identification, but then no one else kind of chimes in on, on this observation. And so this thing kind of sits in this, what we call needs ID purgatory. Um, and because we're using this majority vote, we, we can't move this thing to research grade and include it in that GBIF uh, export. So this is, this is another example of a sort of an inefficient use of the community. 
Okay, and so our goal is to effectively try to fix these problems um, by moving away from majority vote, uh, but without changing sort of the social experience that iNaturalist has built up, right? So at its core, iNat is really a social network for naturalists. So there's a bunch of different ways that we could fix this problem, um, especially if we kind of approached it from a more scientific perspective of, you know, removing biases, trying to get independent votes, um, et cetera. But the INAC guys didn't, they would prefer not to change that. Um, they want this interactive, kind of open, democratic uh, platform. Um, and so um, the idea is to sort of revamp uh, the research grade computation, but do it without really changing the UX. Um, and so now I'm gonna discuss sort of our attempt to build models um, that can learn from the community um, and try to help mitigate some of these problems of potentially corrupting the GBIF export and inefficiently using uh, the expertise. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna break uh, this thing, uh, this, and, and yeah, sorry, and so the, the solution that we kind of present is, is called multi-class crowdsourcing. Um, and so I'm gonna break that framework down into three different blocks. Um, so the first, we'll just sort of introduce the problem in a, in a more constrained setting and we'll build up models of worker classification skills. Uh, and then uh, those models, however, that we're gonna build up don't really match perfectly to INAT, so we're gonna adapt them um, to handle situations where users can see previous users' identifications. Um, and then we're gonna adapt them to handle um, providing uh, labels from a taxonomy rather than a flat list. Um, okay, so let's dive in. <coughs> Okay, so just to kind of make a really cartoony version of this whole process, we're trying to model users, and I'm going to call them interchangeably workers and users, um, that are doing a multi-class classification task, right? So in this example, the task given to a worker is to label an image with a species of a bird. Um, and there's about 10,000 bird species in the world. So when a worker annotates an image, they're choosing one label out of 10,000 options to submit um, as their identification. Um, and we're going to get a series of those annotations uh, from different workers for each image. Um, and so in this case, workers A and B label the image as snowy egret, and worker C label the image as great egret. Um, and so what we're after is this model um, that can learn from the data uh, and is capable of predicting a class label for this image. <coughs> Um, and so the most popular instantiation is to simply, simply do majority vote, right? Um, like iNaturalist currently does. Um, and in such a model, uh, the output would be snowy egret uh, as the prediction. And, uh, but what we want is a model that can learn uh, the skills of the workers and take those skills into account. So these skills are kind of represented as cartoony uh, confusion matrices down here. Um, and so such a model would learn that worker C is more skilled than workers A and B. Um, and the prediction would be great egret, um, which is what this is a picture of. <coughs> um, and so let me just do a brief aside um, to give some attribution. So uh, we're far from the first to kind of consider crowdsourcing. It's a pretty popular um, area, um, especially with the, the need for large data sets. Um, Dawid and Skeen were probably some of the first guys to consider multi-class um, crowdsourcing. Um, and there's been a whole slew of works, um, especially after the, the, the introduction of Amazon Mechanical Turk that's looked at this problem. Um, our work is, is different from, from these prior works in a few different areas. Um, one is we're really trying to handle this large class space. So we're, not, we're not trying to do 10-way classification. We're doing, trying to do 10,000 or 100,000-way classification. Um, we are not in this nice regime where we can assume independence between the annotations. Um, there's a dependence. Um, we bring in computer vision. Um, this is just gonna, I'm gonna briefly introduce this. I'm not really gonna go into the details. Um, um, and then we also sort of do a, a trick to incorporate a taxonomy um, rather than just considering a flat list. Um, so this is our, um, this is kind of the way we differentiate ourselves. <coughs> Um, okay, and so if we go back to our basic setup, um, we're gonna, I'll, I'll introduce some notations. So the variable X is gonna represent an image, um, and the subscript I just indexes that, that current image. Uh, the underlying true label for an image is gonna be noted by Y, 
Um, and that variable can take one of C values that represent the C possible classes we're trying to identify. Um, so for example, snowy egret or great egret. Um, that variable is never revealed to us, right? We never get to see it. Um, but a prediction of that variable um, denoted by Y tilde is going to be the output of our model, right? And this variable is restricted to that same set um, as Y. Um, namely one of these C classes that we're trying to predict. Uh, and so in this example, Y tilde would be great egret. Uh, the worker annotations are going to be denoted by Z, uh, and they're indexed by an image ID and a worker ID. Um, so they can be uh, interpreted as worker A's annotation on image I, um, and those annotations can also take one of these C possible values. Um, and finally, uh, the worker skills are going to be de denoted by this variable W, um, and they're going to be indexed by the worker ID. Um, and so, like I was saying, in this cartoon, these are uh, represented as confusion matrices. <coughs> okay, so if we look under the hood of this model, uh, when it's trying to predict a label for an image, we're simply going to compute the likelihood of every class, um, given the annotations that we've received for that image, and then just return the most likely one, right? Where capital uh, Z sub I is the the set of annotations for uh, image I. Um, okay, and so if we take a look at this likelihood computation, uh, we can expand it out using Bayes' rule. Um, but then we get stuck with this annoying term here, um, uh, which is sort of the probability of, of all these annotations that we've received given a particular class label. Um, and that's not the easiest thing to model, um, so we're going to try and make it easier on ourselves and, and introduce an independence assumption. <coughs> Um, and assume that we can express the likelihood of the annotations as a product of all the individual annotations, right? And so this kind of transforms this cartoon into something like this, um, which we can actually uh, get a grip on. Um, and the reason is because we basically have two terms now, right? So this, this first term is simply a prior for a class. Um, that's just an input to our system, so there's really nothing complex there. Um, and the second term is the likelihood of a worker's response given a class label and their skill, right? And so we, we need to implement this term, and it turns out to be really straightforward. <coughs> We're simply going to use a matrix that's indexed by the class label and the worker annotation, right? So our skill variable um, is this matrix, um, and this matrix is responsible for holding the probability that a worker will label an image with Z sub IJ when the true uh, label for that image is Y sub I. Right? And so pictorially, every worker will have a classification skill matrix uh, and will be able to index into that matrix to, re to retrieve, for example, the probability that the worker will respond with the class great egret when the image actually contains snowy egret. <coughs> okay, so let's just uh, really give a visual, nice simple visual example of this. Um, <coughs> So for, um, this, is, this is the skill matrix for worker J. Um, and in this case, we're gonna do four-way classification, right? So the workers are tasked with labeling an image as containing either a plant, a mammal, a snake, or a bird. Uh, and imagine for a second that we know up front the actual label of every image, right? And so these are the Ys um, from our model, and they're gonna index into the rows of this matrix. And then we'll use worker J's annotations uh, as the predicted label, um, and these are going to index into the column of the matrix. Right? And so, uh, for example, uh, let's give, I'll give a few examples of how this matrix is constructed. So, uh, we have an image of a snake, right? We know it's a snake. Uh, let's just assume that we do. Um, so, we, we know it goes into this row. We show it to the worker, uh, and they say snake. So, this gets inserted here, and we can do this for a few more things. Picture of a bird. What does the worker say? They say bird. Um, Next comes a flower. This time they make a mistake. They say snake. Um, so this falls in the off uh, diagonal entry. Um, and we can do this for a bunch of images uh, and use them to fill out that matrix. And so if we replace the images with the image count uh, and then normalize each row independently, we arrive at you know, what I'm going to call this confusion matrix. Um, and I'll refer to it as a skill matrix as well. Um, and so each entry lets us know the probability of a worker responding with a particular class when we know the ground truth class, right? So in this case, worker J has a 66% likelihood of, of responding with the answer snake when the image really does contain a snake. Um, 
And if worker J were perfectly skilled, um, then their matrix M would simply be the diagonal matrix, uh, representing that they, they never make a mistake. Um, okay, and so more generally, what are we doing? Is we're learning the parameters of a multinomial distribution, uh, in this case, denoted by mu. Um, this can also be called a categorical distribution. Um, and so for each row of our matrix M, um, so in our, in our framework, uh, we estimate the parameters of these distributions just using map estimation, which boils down to counting events, just like we did in our simple example. Um, okay, and so if we have these confusion matrices uh, for every worker, then our calculation for the likelihood uh, of a class is quite simple, right? We'll just index into the appropriate position um, for each worker's matrix, uh, multiply those values together here, multiply by the likelihood of that class occurring, uh, and that's uh, our computation, All right? And so the problem hits us when the number of classes C gets really big. Um, so we have C squared parameters in, in each matrix, uh, and we have a matrix M for each worker, right? So our model parameter count is equal to the number of workers um, times the number of classes squared, All right? And so if we're doing a task with 10,000 classes, and that means we'll be computing a matrix with 100 million entries for every worker, right? And so this is statistically and computationally intractable. Um, and that's not really even as bad as it gets. So, you know, currently on our naturalist, a user has over 500,000 options uh, when putting a species identification on an observation. Um, okay, so what can, can, can something be done? Um, can we try to reduce the number of parameters required per worker? Um, and we can, right? So we can focus on the diagonal entries uh, and ignore the off-diagonal entries. And so in this case, we'll be learning a single number for every class, uh, represent, represent, representing the likelihood uh, of a worker labeling that class uh, correctly. Um, and this time, each parameter represents a Bernoulli uh, parameter. And again, we'll estimate, estimate those using map estimation. Um, we still need to produce this full matrix M, right? Because this is what we need to index into um, during our, our computation. Um, and so we have our diagonal entries, and what we can do is the octagonal entries will be simply one minus that diagonal entry. And so um, the, the rows are properly normalized, but I've just kind of left off that term to keep the notation uh, simple. And so we've reduced the number of, uh, of parameters by a factor of C, but we've given up our ability to distinguish the different types of mistakes that a worker will make. Um, so each of the off-diagonal entries is the, is the same value, um, which isn't the best assumption, right? So you're more likely to confuse crows and ravens than crows and blue jays. Um, but this model doesn't capture that anymore. Um, that's just kind of the price we pay for reducing the parameters. Um, but there's a few tricks that we can play to try and, and recover um, some of those properties uh, of the full multinomial model. Um, we have access to a prior uh, vector for the classes. And so we can make the hypothesis that if a user makes a mistake, uh, the mistake is likely to follow the distribution of classes. Um, so we can effectively scale every entry in each row um, by the prior of that class occurring. Um, and so this results in something perhaps a little bit more reasonable um, although it's still far from reconstructing that nice per class multinomial. Um, but we've, we've still managed to save our, ourselves a factor of C parameters. Um, and there's actually another trick that we can play. And instead of using the class priors to scale the rows, so the class priors is like sort of a property of the entire data set, um, what we can do is we can jointly train a computer vision system and use the output probabilities of that model. Right? And the reason this is really nice um, is because we get a custom per image multiplier, right? So each image gets to get, will give us this vector that we can then scale um, that worker's matrix by. And so for each image, you know, we get this kind of cool different vector. Um, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go, like, there's nothing particularly fancy here. All we end up doing is training a, a deep net um, jointly with the system. So that's, that's the, this is the extent of computer vision for this talk. Uh, um, okay, so um, can we be even more stingy? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah.
Yeah, no, good point. So um, in this simple formulation, yeah, like adding, so adding one extra row isn't, isn't the end of the world. Um, it certainly complicates things. Later on in the talk, we'll introduce sort of a taxonomy. And that gives us quite a bit more flexibility because then a change becomes very localized in that portion of the taxonomy. Uh, and it makes recomputing these skills quite a bit more efficient. Um, but yes, the, the dynamic nature of this, it's like adding more data um, you know, allows us to retrain our vision systems for the existing classes. But yeah, it's that adding that extra class is still kind of a nuisance. Um, and it can be done hackily in a few different ways, but yeah, still just kind of a, kind of a pain. Okay, so can we be even more stingy? Um, can we try and get this thing down to one number per worker? Um, yeah, and sure, we can use uh, a single Bernoulli parameter. And uh, this number basically represents how skillful the worker is, right? So on a scale of zero to one, with one being an expert. Um, and again, we, we still need to construct this matrix M because that's how our model wants to access these skills. And so, um, we'll do something similar to what we did before, but this time we're just going to repeat that one value across the diagonal. Um, and then uh, we'll do the one minus for the off diagonal entries. That's what's going on down here. Um, I've left off the normalization uh, term. Um, and then we can pull the same bag of tricks from before, right? So if we have a, um, a prior for our data set, we can multiply each row um, by that. Or if we jointly train a computer vision system, um, then for each image, we can multiply this matrix uh, by the, the priors coming off that vision system. Uh, and so now we can compare these models. And so we've got our per class multinomial model with C squared parameters. Um, we've got our per class Bernoulli uh, model with C parameters. And uh, we've got our minimalist single Bernoulli model with one parameter. Um, so there's certainly a trade-off in reducing the number of parameters uh, but by using those, those class priors, um, or pr more preferably a computer vision system, we can try to reconstruct um, this original per class multinomial um, using far fewer parameters. And so these, these different skill models are going to be the building blocks uh, for the rest of the system. And they're going to make an appearance um, quite a few more times. Um, and the important thing to sort of keep in mind is that um, we can swap these out for each other and it basically gives us a knob to control how many parameters are ultimately going to be in our model. <coughs> okay, and so for, for those of you wondering kind of how the nuts and bolts works um, and sort of how I get away with knowing the class label or you know, knowing the skill matrices, right, we don't. Um, we just jointly estimate these, the skill matrices and, and the class uh, labels together. Um, there's nothing particularly fancy going on here. Um, just uh, alternating maximization um, until that log likelihood um, converges and then settling there. Um, and details for this can be found in the paper or we can talk about it afterwards. Um, okay, so we can do a quick sanity check of some of these models. Um, and so in this experiment, we asked mechanical Turk workers um, and citizen scientists to identify 69 different uh, species of birds. And so all these species were either sparrows or shorebirds. Um, and so the task wasn't easy. Um, and we did not collect a lot of data per worker, right? So the, these, these models had to learn the skills from very few samples. Um, okay, so let me walk you through the results. Um, so each model here is separated into uh, its own experiment, but the axes line up so you, you can kind of scan back and forth. Um, and so we have label error on the y-axis. Um, and uh, the average number of worker annotations per image on the x-axis. Um, you know, so this is where we would like to be. Um, okay, we have three groups of lines in each plot, right? So one group, two group, three groups, and kind of seem over here and over here as well. Um, and so the topmost group is using only MTurk workers. Um, the bottommost group is using only citizen scientists. And then the middle group is sampling data from both of those communities. All right, and so in, in each of these groups, we have four lines. So the red line um, that you see represents majority vote. The blue line is our basic kind of vanilla worker skill model. Um, the orange line is our basic worker skill model with um, a computer vision system plugged in. Um, the green line 
these are figures from the paper. The, the green line relates to a, a more sophisticated system that actually tries to estimate this likelihood and stop um, uh, before asking for more data. Um, so these, all these experiments kind of run out um, until we've exhausted all possible labels that we've collected. Um, and these green lines were an attempt to, to sort of learn when to stop asking for additional labels on an image. Um, again, I can, we can go over those after the talk or in the paper or something. Um, Okay, so we can do some, some simple sanity checks uh, on these sanity check experiments. So we want to see that the blue line is at or below the red line, right? So that means that we're at, at least doing as good as majority vote. Um, and then we'd like to see that the orange line uh, being below the blue line, right? So that means that like plugging in computer vision is actually helping. Um, and so comparing the models, we don't actually see too much difference between them. Uh, which is interesting. So this means that our, our tricks of reconstructing the skill matrix using fewer parameters is working. Um, however, it still would have been nice to see that the, the fancier models uh, were achieving lower error. And that's actually what's happening here. Um, and so what's going on there? So the difference in, in, with these set of star experiments is that we initialize the models with more informative priors. Um, so in all the other experiments, we basically initialized with uniform, uninformative priors. And here we took the, the task of the domain, asked um, sort of a professional ornithologist what they thought the skills of the different workforces would be, and initialized the models with those. And given those priors, the models were able to take advantage of it and really drive um, the error low. Um, OK. So that was the basic skill models, right? So we built those things up. We can now take them and plug them into different parts of the model. Um, and now we're going to tackle dependent annotations. So this is, this is the part of the talk that actually tries to figure out how to take these things and plug them into the iNaturalist uh, website. Okay, so remember we assumed this independence between the worker annotations. Uh, and we liked that uh, assumption because uh, it really kept the math simple. But that's just not the way iNaturalist works. Right, so uh, if the end of... If the independence assumption were true, then workers would provide their annotation based solely off of looking only at the photograph. Um, but on iNaturalist, the interface actually allows you to see everybody else's uh, uh, previous labels. Um, so, you know, this fourth guy actually got to see the three previous ones as well as the photo. Um, and so we expect that the workers' responses are going to be biased by the prior responses. Right? And so from economics, um, this is known as herding behavior, um, and it's been studied in the past. Um, you can see sort of these are some two classic works there. Um, and uh, in terms of computer vision data set collection, um, either this task, this, this problem isn't there because you constructed it on Mechanical Turk where you ensure independence of the labels, or if it is there, it's just generally ignored. Um, but we're going to try to incorporate it into our model. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is, is timestamp the worker annotations, where T represents time. Um, and this introduces slightly more annoying syntax, but basically we've just numbered the worker annotations for each image um, so that we know who did the first annotation, who did the second annotation, and so forth. Um, and then this H variable is going to contain all the prior responses up to time T minus 1. Um, all right, and so now we need to take this H variable uh, and plug it into our model of the noisy worker responses. <clears throat> so the, the likelihood of the teeth worker providing their annotation is now conditioned on the fact that they got to see um, all the annotations uh, from time one to t minus one. Um, and so, okay, let's use the chain rule and do some rearranging, um, and we're gonna marginalize over the possible annotations um, to get this thing into a little bit more convenient format. Um, where we've now decomposed it again into kind of two important terms, right? So this first term um, is what we saw before, and we know how to compute that, right? This is just the same noisy worker model, um, and we can use one of those basic models that we built up in the last section and plug it in there. Um, okay, so now we're left with this new term, which is the likelihood of the previous annotations given a worker's response, right? And this term is effectively weighting or biasing the evidence that the worker considers from the image alone, right? Okay, and so let me try to draw a diagram of how that, 
the, the model is operating now. Um, and again, we're trying to model the annotation response of a worker on the iNaturalist website where they get to view the image as well as all the previous annotations, right, before providing their own identification. Okay, and so our model of the annotation process for a worker basically does two things. Right, so first, it assumes that a worker will analyze the image and will consider all possible annotations with the likelihood of each possible annotation controlled by their skill matrix. Right, this is the thing that we built up before. Right, and for each one of those possible annotations, uh, the worker will go see how that annotation fits in with the prior responses. Right, and they're going to scale that likelihood of the annotation accordingly. Right, and so that's, that's kind of the basics. And so if you buy into this, then we just need to implement this term. Right, and so the first thing we're going to do is make the map easy by introducing an independence assumption. Um, and so we're going to assume that the worker treats each of the previous responses as independent sources of information, right? And so pictorially, it looks like this, where we've simplified this kind of annoying conditional probability into three easier conditional probabilities, right? Okay, and so now what is this term? So this is a noisy model of a previous worker's response but conditioned not on the class label that we, like we've been seeing before, that was the Y. This time it's conditioned on the current worker's annotation, right? And so, so now we have this new skill variable, um, which is worker J's perception of worker K skill, right? So this thing plugs in right here. Okay, and so let's go back to kind of um, simple pictures. Um, okay, so every worker has a set of classification skills, right? These are basically what we built up before. Um, in addition to this, every worker has a set of perceptions of the skills of the, all the other workers on iNaturalist, right? So inside their head, they've got an idea of how users A and B, what the skill matrices of users A and B are, right? And we're going to model those perceptions of the other workers using perceived skill matrices denoted as P. And our mechanism for modeling these P uh, matrices is going to be the exact same thing that we did for modeling the matrix M, right? So, namely, we can just use one of these simple models that we built up. Either the multinomial, the per-class Bernoulli, or the single Bernoulli. Right? And so, modeling a worker's perception of all the other workers can get really expensive. Right? There's, like we were seeing, there's a bunch of different users on iNaturalist. Um, you know, so we've, we've added this huge computational burden. Um, and so we're going to make this a little bit more tractable by... Um, instead of doing independent ones for each worker, we're gonna pool across all the other workers and basically learn for each worker uh, what their general perception of the other users on iNaturalist is, right? And again, for that general perception, it's just gonna be one of these three simple models. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we, yeah, right. So, yeah, pictorially, um, yeah, imagine maybe like the, the very faint ones could be pushed to zero or something. And so really it's like those two would be non-zero, those two, maybe this one would be non-zero. Yeah. Um, okay, and so one interesting thing here is the, the single Bernoulli model, because that basically captures, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's where we use this thing. Um, and it basically captures how trusting a particular worker is of all of the other workers on iNaturalist. You know, so does the worker assume that other people are just like are, are, are experts? Do they assume that other people are novices? Um, that's what that's trying to capture. Okay, and so one last thing before I finish. So we made this initial assumption to make the math easy, right? We broke down this um, conditional into three independent uh, conditionals. Um, we can also try to model this, like we actually can try to model this situation um, where worker J may choose to account for the fact that, you know, these earlier responses were also biased, right? So it's this kind of this recursive notion of bias. Um, and that leads us to this recursive definition um, where we recurse backwards through time um, on these annotations. And at each one of those time steps, we index into the 
respective perceived skill matrices, um, and the recursion ends with the very first annotation, right, which is just the index into the um, one skill matrix. Okay, so I don't have a collection of kind of sanity checking models for this, uh, uh, or sanity checking experiments for that section. Um, this plot will be presented after the next section that introduces taxonomic models, um, but I just wanted to, sh to um, highlight that you know, actually modeling the way the system, the, the data was actually collected, um, leads to um, a really nice decrease in error. Um, and so in this case, it was the effect of modeling that dependence uh, allowed us to decrease the label error of our predicted data set by 85%. Okay, so our model can now account uh, for that dependence between the workers. Um, and now let's take a crack at a taxonomy. <coughs> Okay, so up to this point, uh, we've been tackling multi-class classification where we have a list um, of uh, classes from which workers can choose their, their annotation. Um, so this list would be of size 10K for, um, for the bird task. Um, another way to interpret this is um, as a flat taxonomy where uh, each species in, uh, in the list now corresponds to a leaf node. Um, and workers have been providing leaf node uh, annota annotations. Um, iNaturalist, though, uh, rather than being a flat taxonomy, uh, is, is like sitting on this huge, dense taxonomy. Um, so we have you know, a plant subtree, a bird subtree, an insect subtree, um, and there's some nice advantages of actually bringing in that taxonomy, right? So first, Workers can hedge their bets if they're not sure of the class label, right? So they're looking at an image, they're not sure what it is, but they know it's a lizard, you know, they know it's a reptile. Um, and so an example of that is this observation. So this was another one from me. Um, I could get it down to genus, but I wasn't sure which species um, or subspecies it was. Um, and so I could just upload the observation and then label it at the genus node rather than at a, at a species node. <coughs> Um, and then I could let more skilled identifiers um, come in and, and provide the, the species ID. And secondly, you know, another benefit of actually incorporating this taxonomy is that um, we can reduce the number of model parameters by not modeling confusions between classes located in you know, uh, different subtrees of the taxonomy. Okay, so what do I mean? So it's, it's probably not necessary to model the confusion of workers between passion flowers and burrowing owls, right? It's just unlikely for them to make mistakes. Um, the entry, you know, in their skill matrix will most likely be zero, and it would be great if we didn't have to bother storing a zero or computing a zero. Okay, and so a, a taxonomy, you know, basically gives us this information for free, right? So we have passion flowers sitting in one subtree, and we have burrowing owls sitting in another subtree. Um, and so we can use the taxonomy to restrict which entries of that you know, confusion matrix or skill matrix we're going to compute. Right? And the resulting structure will have a block diagonal shape. It won't necessarily look exactly like this. Um, but doing this will give us you know, a, a pretty drastic um, parameter savings. Okay, so if, for example, consider the ode subtree. So odes are dragonflies and damselflies. Um, there's about <coughs> 6,000 of these things. Um, so using non taxonomic models, um, so these are models that can't take advantage of, of inner node labels from workers. You get the top row of parameter counts. Um, again, these are, these are for those initializing those different um, worker skill um, setups that we built before. Um, and then the bottom row shows those same parameter counts, but for these taxonomic models. Um, and so the, the obvious one is this one, right? So using kind of our the model that we want to use, this per class multinomial, which really captures the, the workers' confusion amongst the classes, we can bring it down from 36 million to 280,000, which is still a lot. You know, there's nothing to sneeze about, but um, it's certainly more tractable than 36 million. And, you know, and when this is too much, we can default to something like this, and if this is still too much, we can default to something like that. Um, okay, so how do, can we adapt our models for a taxonomy? Um, okay, so you know, I, I introduced this example before where we kind of learned how to fill out the confusion matrix. Um, and so we'll remap this into a taxonomic um, situation. So we're asking workers to classify plants versus mammals versus snakes versus birds. 
Um, we can reinterpret that problem as a classification task over a flat taxonomy. So we have our, our root node um, and our four leaf nodes. And if our class label is snake um, and the worker label is snake, then we can compute the likelihood of that worker response by first retrieving the skill matrix um, for that worker, which will be stored at the parent node. And um, we, can in, we can basically, now that we have it, we can index it just as if uh, we did before, right? And so we'll simply index into the appropriate entry of the skill matrix and get the probability, right? So you know, we, we figured out where these guys are. We go back up to the parent. The parent's actually storing the confusion matrix for across its children, and then we'll index into that matrix. Okay, and so if we grow the tree, so now the worker label um, and the class label are down here. All we're going to do is traverse from the root of the tree down to that area and index into the appropriate skill matrices after each traversal, multiply them together um, to get our likelihood. Um, and this is ba that's just the exact same process we did before, it's just we have a few different levels, right? And so we're going to access and multiply by the probability that this worker la uh, labeled level one of the taxonomy correctly for this given image, followed by level two, and finally level three. Right? All right, and so we can render these skill matrices um, for these nodes uh, and visualize the matrix indices that we're, that we're indexing into. There's one typo here. There should be four, not three entries in that matrix. Um, so imagine this plant isn't here. You know, so we index into here, get this value. Uh, index into here and get this value, and then finally index into this and get this value, and we'd multiply these values together, right? And so uh, for, for illustrative purposes, we can kind of move around um, where the class label sits and see kind of how we would index into these matrices. Um, so you can, you can kind of follow the red dots. Um, you know, so this looks good. This is just now indexing into here. This looks good. This looks good. Um, even this is okay, right? So this is the worker hedging their bets. You know, so we don't descend all the way down to this level. We just stop here. Um, okay, but this is bad, right? And so when computing the likelihood um, of the worker's annotations when the class label and the worker annotation um, are not siblings, right? So they're no longer siblings, the formula breaks, right? And so we, we don't have a row entry into this skill matrix, right, for this Y value. Um, and so to fix this, we're going to incorporate an extra vector in, which will store at each one of the inner nodes um, the parameters for a multinomial distribution that basically capture the likelihood of a worker choosing one of those child nodes. Right? And so as soon as the path for the class label and the worker label deviate, we're going to switch to multiplying by just the likelihood um, of a worker choosing a particular child node um, for the rest of the path. Um, and so mathematically, this looks like the following. So we're traversing the worker's annotation. Um, and at each inner node, we're multiplying by the likelihood of the worker choosing a child node given the class label. And this value that we're multiplying will either be from the worker skill matrix Ms, which are stored at the inner nodes, or it'll be by a value stored in the N vector, which are also stored uh, in those inner nodes. And that's if the paths uh, diverge, right? So if the parents of those two nodes aren't the same. Okay, um, and of course, to implement the skill matrix, you can choose from one of our basic models again, right? So at each inner node, we can store a per child node multinomial, or a per child node Bernoulli, or a per child node um, single Bernoulli. Or actually, just a single Bernoulli for each inner node, not per child. Okay, and we can do the exact same thing for the skill perception matrices, right? So these is inside each person's head, they have their perceived skills of everybody else, and we're going to model it essentially the exact same way, right? And so this time, rather than M and N, we have P and R, right? So this is our P matrix for the perceived skills, and then as soon as these things diverge, it, this is a worker's perception of how other people will just, you know, randomly, not randomly, but how they'll choose nodes as they um, traverse the taxonomy. Okay, so that's everything, right? So um, we created the classification skill models, then we updated them to handle dependent annotations, and then we updated them again to handle um, labels coming from a taxonomy. Um, so we started off with something basic and adapted it uh, to better match the way um, the annotations are actually collected on a naturalist. <clears throat> and so we can see how these models perform. 
And so um, this time we're going to use um, data that we just grabbed straight from iNaturalist. Um, so we sampled research grade observations from 30 bird species and constructed a data set where we allow only the user's first identification, right? So currently iNaturalist has a sort of a mechanism to, to save itself from the majority vote problems and that's by allowing people to come in and change their answers, right? So they can be convinced by other people on the website to, to, to do that. But in this experiment, we've, we've only taken their first um, identification. Um, and then the, we verified the, the actual correct ground truth labels by passing it to uh, ornithologists to, to vet the images. Okay, and so for, for this experiment, I'm just gonna focus on the results from the multinomial model, right? So this is the sort of the quote unquote most powerful of the models. Um, and I'll highlight the com contribution of each one of the system adjustments, right? So the, again, the red line is our majority vote line. And the blue line is the vanilla, um, you know, uninformative prior uh, worker skill model, <coughs> right? And so using a taxonomic model, decreased error by 36% over majority vote. And so kind of like, you know, the taxonomic model allowed us to save parameters. And so that's uh, in some form a, a regularization that we applied. Uh, modeling the dependence between uh, among the annotations, right? So this is taking into account the, the time at which these annotations arrived, resulted in that 85% decrease in error. Um, and then using both the taxonomic model and handling the dependence and annotations resulted in a 90% decrease in error, right? So, and again, reminding people, the decrease in error, that's the, that's the error of your labeled data set, right? So this is kind of the data set that we're potentially shipping off to GBIF. Um, Okay, so overall it seems like you know, the system is starting to figure out kind of the skills of the different workers and is combining those skills appropriately when coming up with a label uh, for an image. Okay, so that's on, that's on data that we were able to vet the actual ground truth label. Um, but now the question is, is you know, can we run this system across the entire iNaturalist database, right? And so at the time um, I wrote up these slides that, gave, that consisted of 12 million observations, or the time I, I did the experiment. That was 12 million observations, 30 million identifications, and 300,000 users. Um, and the answer is yes, but we have to be kind of nifty with how we do this. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to quote unquote sanitize the taxonomy. Um, and we are going to reduce it to the seven classic ranks. So if you go talk to someone who works with taxonomies for the tree of life, they have nodes like infra order and inter order and subspecies and varieties and hybrids. We're gonna like prune all that stuff away and roll them up to ancestors. Um, and so the, what we're left with is just kind of these, the, the quote unquote classic ranks. Um, and then rather than running one giant model across all of those, we're gonna, we're gonna try and reduce the computational space even more and we're gonna run it just at the class level. And the reason we do this is because, um, you know, we have reasons to believe that people are decent at getting something to class, you know, whether they know what, what class taxonomically is or not. But like, so examples of that are birds versus reptiles versus insects, right? So those are all class nodes in our taxonomy. So we're gonna run parallel models um, across those. Um, and then we're gonna use our absolute cheapest models, right? So this is our single binomial model um, for both the worker skills and for the perceived worker skills. Um, and you know, okay, so making those uh, architecture decisions, we can uh, grab basically a snapshot of the INAT database, run our computations, and then we can, there's no more um, ground truth data, right? We don't know what the right answer is. So there's no making error plots. Um, but what we can do is now we can start making some kind of cool interfaces that allow us to really go and explore what these observations are, what the different types of users are. And so here's some examples. Um, so for every observation, you know, we now have a predicted label along with the confidence of that prediction. And so um, one thing that we can do is we can go get all observations that are labeled with research grade. Um, you know, that's the, the two thirds consensus majority vote. And we can see um, you know, how they stack up with uh, the model's prediction, right? And so we find observations like this where we have two agreeing species IDs, um, but the confidence of the system is actually is low in terms of, um, if you looked at kind of a histogram of the scores, this would be sort of an outlier. Um, and this is actually a good thing because this is a millipede. Um, so this, this is in a totally different section of the tree of life than the common, wood, uh, the common pill woodlouse. And so the model has learned that 
users often make this confusion, and so it's actually it's, we're kind of requesting a third person to come in here and chime in before it's confident um, that this is the right uh, answer. Um, and then we find observations like this, where um, you know this is a needs ID observation. We have two conflicting identifications, um, but the model is highly confident um, in this second identification. Um, and this is kind of a, um, uh, an example of sort of efficiently using the crowd. Um, you know, if, if your threshold for research grade was actually 98%, we don't need anybody else to come in and look at this observation, right? We can direct work to those people that, you know, doesn't consist of this observation. Um, then we find things like this. So if you guys, these are, I presented those kind of three different cartoon examples of problems with INAT in the very beginning of the talk, and these are basically real life examples of the system trying to fix those things. So this is a, an example of a lonely expert problem um, with the needs, with the sort of the majority vote paradigm. Um, and you know, if we look at the, the output from the system, um, this thing is quite confident in uh, Jim's skills and doesn't really need anybody else to come in and chime in on this, uh, this image. Um, okay. And so, you know, another output of this thing is the set of taxonic skills um, for all the users on INA. Um, and so we can ask questions like, who is skilled at identifying this particular um, genus of hawks? Um, and so we get this nice ranked list, basically, of all these people, you know, from what we consider most skilled to least skilled. Um, and this kind of system can be used to um, direct observations to particular people um, who will have the skills necessary to make the identification. Um, similar example would be for the pica. Um, you can ask who's who's good at identifying these things uh, for the family. Um, and again, we get this nice sorted list back um, of all these folks who probably have the skills necessary to identify a photo of, of that species. <coughs> um, and so, kind of putting it all together, and and you know, this this slide is also good at, at showing um, the benefits of this system in kind of more of an industrial application. So. What we've done really is we've gone through, and basically for every image and label, we've put a risk associated on uh, our confidence for that label, right? And so we can sort the whole database by this, you know, risk of do we trust the label on our image? Um, and so if you look at the current system for iNaturalist, you've got these research grade labels and these needs IDs, but we can see that there's some needs ID that are like, you know, the risk on the label is quite low, and so. An alternative system for um, computing research grade and needs ID is based purely off this risk, where you know, we set it at 2.5%. So if the risk, and that's basically the, you know, the, the one minus the confidence in our label, is greater than 2.5%, then we're going to ask more people to come in and chime in on those observations. And if it's, if it's less than that, then we're going to call it um, research grade. You know, and we can include it into our GBIF export, which will be made available to, to scientists and conservationists. And you know, you can do the same thing for you know self-driving car companies, um, any like sort of image search, anything really with with a computer vision or, or any kind of data set where you're trying to label something and you want to get this notion of risk um, of an associated annotation. You can sort the data set by that risk, and then you can go see you know what are those samples that are highly that are you know very unlikely to be risky. What are the high risk ones? Um, you know, and that might lead you to make decisions on the annotation interface that you're using and how you're directing work to, to the different workforces, et cetera. Um, okay, and so the, the future work of this project is teaching, right? So we've, we've kind of did all this work to get the skill of somebody, um, which is kind of represented by this, this cartoony confusion matrix. And what we'd like to do is now schedule a sequence of operations to convert that confusion matrix into something that's more skilled, right? So kind of get just the diagonal entries filled in. Um, and there's been some prior work on this in the past. Again, it's, it's kind of tackled really small problems. These are like five class, 10 class problems. You know, we'd like to do it with you know, the 10,000 bird species of the world and have a taxonomy across it. Um, and so that's kind of, um, I think that would be like a really cool um, uh, place to push in the future. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so the whole talk kind of focused on actually building a data set. So we took the iNaturalist database, did a bunch of processing to it, and then turned it into a computer vision data set. Um, and that ties into to Seek because we, we do this. This actually gives us a data set that we can then plug into here. 
the, some of the nifty things for making seek run fast is really just matrix factorization. So these, the fully connected layers of a, of a convolutional network is what's gonna kill you when you start getting to a large number of classes. Um, and it turns out that you really just don't need all those parameters, right? Those things are way over parameterized. Um, and you can go a long ways by just introducing two factorized versions of that matrix, um, save a bunch of parameters, and um, allow it to be something you can download onto your phone and then run you know, with, with a varying degree of, of speed, whether it's five hertz, 20 hertz, or, or more. Um, okay, so this project was done with Pietro um, and Serge, who I introduced before, and then Steve Branson, who was a postdoc at, at Caltech. Um, so thanks to those guys, and thanks to you. <laughs>